Uh, just as a, as a quick note, uh, I just want to let you know that this lecture is being recorded. Um, anyways, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center here at Western Washington University. Um, the, uh, the Internet Studies Center aims to foster uh, an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technology. Uh, the lecture series is presenting uh, leading scholars and practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology and its place in the world. A bit about our speaker today. Uh, Paul Durish is the Chancellor's Professor of Informatics in the Donald Bren School of Information and Computer Science at UC Irvine. Uh, and he has courtesy appointments in computer science and anthropology. He's also an honorary Pro professorial fellow in computing and information systems at the University of Melbourne. Uh, his research focuses primarily on understanding information technology as a site of social and cultural production. His work combines uh, topics in uh, uh, human computer interaction, social informatics, and science and technology studies. Um, he is the author of several books, most recently, The Stuff of Bits. At, uh, an essay on the materialities of information uh, from MIT Press. Uh, he is a fellow of the Association of, uh, for Computing Machinery and a fellow of the British Computer Society and a recipient of the Computer Supported Cooperative Work Lasting Impact Award. So with that, we're gonna start the lecture. Um, Paul is, is here with us, but he's, uh, he's pre-recorded his, his lecture. So I'm, I'm gonna play that now. And then once the the lecture once the recorded lecture is finished, we'll have some time for uh, Q and A. So, somebody told me once that you should never begin a talk with an apology, which is good advice. But um, I'm going to break that rule today because. Um, I want to apologize for the manner in which I'm having to present the, 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 my lecture. Um, I'm away from home for a few days, and when I arrived here, I discovered that the internet service is not quite all that I might have hoped. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure that it's up to sustaining a, a, a Zoom link terribly well. Um, and so what I've decided to do is pre-record the lecture part of um, of today's event, and I'll have Dr. O'Hara play it into the um, uh, into the stream, and then I'll be here live for the Q and A section at the end. So it's not an ideal way of doing things because we can't inter you can't interrupt and we can't interact while I'm while I'm presenting, but it's probably better than having um, the, the the service give out while I'm like halfway through my halfway through my talk or something. So so I hope you'll um, bear with me for bear with me for that. Um, let me pull up my slides here so that you can see them. Okay. So what I'd like to talk about today is um, some of the discussion going on in the context of the, the sort of rapid rise of contemporary AI and data analytics. Um, actually, that's not quite true. <laughs> What's not true is I wouldn't like to talk about that. I'd really rather not talk about AI or not talk about it at all, but, um, but one must, it's the rule. Um, at the moment, not only are sort of all conversations in computer and information science becoming conversations about AI, but it seems like there at the very least there's a, there's a sort of overlap almost always, um, and almost any of the ways in which we think about digital representations and that we think about digital procedures and, de and decision-making have become AI-based conversations. So, um, so it's a pressing, a pressing um, discussion, and sort of AI. You don't need me to tell you that AI is is having a moment, right? That the front page of our newspapers um, are full of stories about the potential of AI, um, both for good and for ill. Its potential um, transformation of labor markets, of um, healthcare, um, of other kinds of um, other kinds of sort of areas of human life. Um, it seems to sort of be inserting itself in all over the place. And perhaps unsurprisingly, then not only is AI having a moment, um, but the domain of ethics and ethical reasoning is having a moment too. Uh, that is that as we think both about AI and indeed about other things and other sort of um, technological changes that we're experiencing, 
um, we're frequently forced to grapple with the the goods and ills that those bring the the problems that potentially attend the deployment of sort of large scale data analytics the question even of data data ownership and data sovereignty the questions about what sorts of things we are prepared to cede to corporations or to machines um what kinds of decision making we're prepared to appear to um uh, to to take up, um, and so so the 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 word ethics um, just you know, a couple of years ago we would say that it was un really unusual that the word algorithm was now the front page um, term in 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 newspapers, and we could say much the same about ethics, which has become a very prominent conversation um, in the world in general, but especially in the tech field. As I go around to computer science departments and information science departments, both around the the U.S. and and, and internationally, um, the conversation about ethics and where that fits within the curriculum and where it fits within the professional practice are very prominent ones. Ironically enough, ethics is having a moment in other ways too. Um, it is, again, sort of a little surprising to see moral philosophy at the center of a network television sitcom, but you know, these are the times in which we live. Um, and so, so there's a lot, of, um, a lot of, uh, of, of good reasons to talk about ethics right now. Now, Although I say there's a lot of good reasons, I have to say too that I do it with a certain amount of trepidation. Um, because the one of the questions that has bedeviled me since um, starting, starting to, to sort of think about this work is whether the term ethics is actually be, is actually helpful here, whether it might be doing us more harm than good, and what are the problems that we may stumble over by even our use of the, the, the very term. And there's a couple of different kinds of elements to this. This is also, I'll say, as I say in a minute, um, this is something I've sort of changed my mind about over the last um, few months. But um, there's, I, you know, I've actually got a, a paper in progress where I sort of try to detail all the various kinds of problems of this term. But um, some of them, uh, well, one of them, for instance, is what I call the administrative problem, which is that um, when we talk about ethics and when we talk about the need to assess um, and measure um, ethical behavior in technological practice, we frequently set up a notion of ethics as an administrative procedure, a procedure whereby approval is granted or denied, um, whereby an administra administrative evaluation takes place to determine whether things are ethical or not. And indeed, although in the United States we use the term IRB, Institutional Review Board, for a procedure whereby um, um, experimental human subject practices are, are um, assessed for their for their the, the benefits and costs that they may uh, offer elsewhere in the anglophone world in the UK in Australia for instance that's often actually called ethics the board that's called IRB in the US is often called the ethics board the procedure of getting ethical approval is called getting ethics or doing ethics um, and so the way in which we use the word automatically I think often invokes a certain kind of administrative um, uh, mindset that I think might actually be harmful rather than helpful um, for us thinking about what the ethics of AI and data analytics should be. The second problem or a second problem with the notion of ethics is a problem of adversarialism. That is, if we have a bunch of people who are doing technical work and then a bunch of other people come along and say, hi, we're here to make sure that your work is ethical, it sort of suggests that the people doing the technical work would, if left to their own devices, be unethical, which isn't a very um, useful way to start a conversation. It invokes the interest of ethics as a sort of policing function. It invokes the idea that those who care about the ethics of data and the ethics of AI are somehow morally superior and are, and are here to, um, to judge uh, those who are engaged in technological practice. And as I say, I don't think that's a useful foundation for having a productive partnership and a conversation um, between so social scientists on one side and, um, and technological uh, developers on the other. A third problem that I find with the term ethics is what sorts of other languages are um, erased or pushed out when we decide that the language of ethics is the language that we want to use to discuss the potential harms or benefits of, of uh, data technologies. That is, when we speak the language of ethics, we're not, for instance, speaking the language of law. 
When we speak the language of ethics, we're not speaking the language of policy. When we speak the language of ethics, we're not speaking the language of politics. Um, if I were to frame questions as ethical questions, then I'm framing them as, as questions of right or wrong. If instead, for instance, I was to frame um, some of those same questions, same debates as questions of politics, then I might have the notion of a continual ongoing contest of struggle between different groups and different interests that are a sort of inherently in tension that are never absolutely resolved and will always be sort of done and done again. And that's a very different way of thinking about what the questions are. So, so I, I start this work with a certain amount of trepidation about the use of the word ethics just um, in, in total. And in fact, when I started thinking about some of the questions I want to talk about today, I was doing it in a way, I was trying to avoid the word ethics altogether. Um, I eventually came to a position that I had to use the term ethics because that's the term that everybody uses. That's the term in which the, the conversation is being framed both inter internally to um, our academic disciplines and, and externally as well. And I've actually come to a, a third position now, which is that, in fact, it's important to reclaim the word ethics. Um, it's important to reclaim that word as um, and make it um, something stronger than it might be otherwise. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at an event with a number of activist groups and discovered that, in fact, as soon as you said ethics, they were um, just basically turned off because that, as far as they were concerned, um, ethics was a term that was used to mask or distract from um, fundamental you know, inequities in the, in, in, in the tech world. Um, and they used the term ethics washing to refer to the way, rather like greenwashing, to refer to the ways in which um, corporations might set up ethics boards and appoint um, advisors uh, um, to sort of like um, give the impression that they are taking these concerns seriously and often to avoid um, um, being regulated by, uh, by, by governments or state actors and so forth. So they were very skeptical about the word ethics. And I think, in fact, it's important for us to reclaim that word, to allow the word ethics to mean more than simply the creation of a sort of performative oversight board um, and to, um, to sort of reinvigorate a conversation about moral reasoning at the heart of the, the, the digital enterprise. So I've sort of like changed my mind about that. The other thing that um, is potentially problematic about ethics is that it sort of means so many different kinds of things. There are a lot of different kinds of positions. And to, um, to very glibly, uh, you know, and at a most superficial level summarize several thousand years of, of, of thinking and writing, um, most sort of, uh, of, of what people talk about when they talk about ethics falls into sort of these three broad categories, um, uh, virtue ethics, deontological ethics, and consequentialist ethics. So, so these are different kind of tr intellectual traditions, virtue ethics going back to sort of Aristotle, deontological going back to, 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 to Kant, consequentialist coming from other sort of enlightenment thinkers. Um, and the notion of virtue ethics is the idea that the foundation of moral judgment and the foundation of ethical decision making is the cultivation of certain kinds of um, virtues, personal virtues, virtues of the individual. And so these are virtues like um, truthfulness and consistency. Um, and fairness and so forth, right? And so you might I'd say that the job of ethics is to develop, the, to, to, to inculcate these virtues in a person such that they act in a morally appropriate way um, by holding to um, and ex most fully expressing um, these kinds of virtues, so that an ethical person is somebody who embodies these virtues. Now, now there might be debate about which are the right sets of virtues and which are the most important and what happens when they sort of uh, um, are in tension and so forth. But the fundamental idea, the heart of, um, of virtue ethics is this idea about the sort of morally upright person and the expression of broadly recognized virtues. Deontological ethics by, cons uh, um, by, um, by distinction um, places its emphasis on, on duty and rule following. So a deontological ethics is one that says that the correct behavior, upright behavior, ethical and morally um, um, 
uh, appropriate behavior is the consistent application of mutually agreed upon um, rules. And so to act um, appropriately, one must exercise one's duty to follow the rules that society has collectively developed. And again, we can debate about what those rules actually are, and we can debate about um, what it means to follow them, but the fundamental idea at the heart of a deontological um, um, account of ethics is, um, is, is duty and rule following. Consequentialist ethics um, um, have their focus um, not so much on the procedures by which we will choose what to do, but by the consequences of our actions. And so de de consequentialist accounts of ethics, such as, for instance, sort of utilitarianism, um, uh, argue that the, um, our, the process of determining whether something is ethically reasonable, whether it's morally upstanding and so forth, um, requires us to look at the consequences of action rather than at the foundations or causes of action. So these are sort of like three different kinds of accounts that, um, and again, at a very superficial level, uh, characterize an enormous amount of, um, of, of what people think about and talk about when they talk about, when they talk about ethics. I've, in, in trying to sort of think about this with respect to AI and data technologies, I find a number of problems with each of these um, that I'm going to sort of like, I'm not going to rehearse them right at the moment because I'm going to sort of bring them up, um, bring them up later. But what I want to sort of suggest is that at least in my own work, finding problems with all three of these, I've been turning more towards um, feminist ethics of care. Um, I want to start off by explaining something about the history of care ethics and feminist ethics, um, and then talk a little bit about what, how it is that we might distinguish between um, ethics of care and a virtue approach or a deontological approach and so forth. So the work of um, uh, the work of Carol, Carol Gilligan, um, a, a social psychologist, is pretty much the origin point for, for this work. And Gilligan was writing in the context of prior work that had suggested, that had been looking at um, the at, at ethics from uh, the standpoint of um, developmental psychology. Um, and the prevailing notion in that field was that men and boys developed um, ethical reasoning faster um, or in a more sophisticated way um, than, than women. Not to say that um, by, the, by, by um, their adulthood they were more ethical, but rather that their ethical reasoning, um, um, ethical reasoning uh, of women, development of ethical reasoning of women lagged um, that of men. Um, the way in which this um, conclusion had been formed was through laboratory work um, and, uh, and surveys that sort of presented people, um, presented children with ethical problems and ethical dilemmas, solicited their um, thinking and their attitudes towards these, um, and then analyzed the forms of reasoning in which they were engaged. Um, and, and again, sort of in order to form this hypothesis that, um, that, that the, the, the male development of ethical reasoning um, was um, in advance of um, um, women and girls of the same age. Gilligan, on the other hand, um, presented an alternative um, account of this. She, her argument was essentially that it was not the case that moral development was lagging in, in women, but rather that the forms of ethical reasoning in which they engaged were often of a different sort. That is that the male accounts of, of the male sort of forms of ethical reasoning were grounded in an ethics of justice, of appropriateness, of retribution, of fairness and balance um, across across different kinds of uh, across different people in different situations. And Gilligan's argument was that women's ethical reasoning um, was often framed on a on a different basis, and it was framed on the basis of care. <laughs> 
So rather than expressing an ethics of justice, the, the, the women who were part of these developmental psychological experiments were expressing an ethics of care. And if one only imagined that ethics was an ethics of justice, then one might conclude that female ethical reasoning was developmentally lagged with respect to male. But if one recognized these as two different kinds of ethical reasoning, then there is no developmental lag. There's just different forms of reasoning. Now, again, um, let's just be clear that this is not to say you know, women think differently about this than men, but are, these, these things are sort of linked to a variety of cultural practices and a variety of ways in which uh, um, we, 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 we raise children. Um, and it's sort of coming out of a debate about, um, about a sort of like gendered account of ethics. But the gendered account of ethics that Gerligan wants to identify is a gendered cultural bias rather than um, a, a sort of a particular notion of how men are and a particular notion of how women are. It's not essentialist in those kinds of ways. So, so Gilligan's book, um, In a Different Voice, was the, the book that sort of like laid the foundations then of what was later picked up by a variety of, um, um, of, of moral philosophers and developed into a larger account of uh, that placed care um, as an alternative form of, uh, of ethical reasoning um, that, uh, that, that contrasts with the more justice-oriented approaches that um, had predominated within, within moral philosophy up until that point. And so people like Joan Tronto and Nell Noddings and Virginia Held um, and more are people who have sort of really done a lot of work in carrying forward this particular way of, way of thinking. Um, so, so, so what is a, 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 an ethics of care? Um, well, uh, Toronto's description is a species activity that includes everything that we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. And the other quote I have on this slide comes from Virginia Held, who describes um, ethics of care as the compelling moral salience of attending to and meeting the needs of the particular others for whom we take responsibility. So, so let's just have a quick you know, what, what's going on in here. Um, there, are, there are some important ideas that I think begin to show um, an alternate account that might be useful for us in an AI and data context. There's, for instance, the notion of attending to and meeting the needs of others. That is, it's sort of outward directed, it's directed towards, um, towards others rather than directed towards the self. Um, similarly, um, uh, the the idea of sort of maintaining continue and repair speaks to not a sort of like individual moments of decision making, but rather to an ongoingness um, that's at the center of what a care ethics might be. So let's look at some of the sort of specific features here. Um, there's four um, aspects that I want to sort of draw attention to. The first is that a foundational principle for an e feminist ethics of care is that flourishing is collective. That is, in contrast to a notion that, um, that I can be a morally upstanding person on my own through the um, appropriate activation of or development of or nurturance of particular kinds of values, particular kinds of ways of being, and that we get a collect, you know, an ethical society by having a whole bunch of ethical individuals. Rather, what the, the, the care ethicists argue is that we need to think about flourishing as a collective, not simply as individual, not thinking about individual benefit, but thinking about the whole, not just thinking about individual contributions, but thinking about how it takes those sort of mass up. And so collectivity, mutuality are absolutely at the heart of what a feminist care ethics has to say about how it is that ethical reasoning takes place. The second thing that I would sort of draw attention to is the way in which this form of reasoning, um, sorry, I'm finding my place in my notes, this form of reasoning um, sort of reassesses the division between public life and private life. Um, lots of where the places where we have sort of explored 
um, particularly in the Enlightenment context, uh, you know, ethical reasoning and moral philosophy has been in theories of politics and theories of governance. That's sort of where, you know, that's where, you know, Kant was writing, that's where, you know, Jeremy Bentham was writing, that's where John Locke and so forth were writing. These were people who were concerned about forms of governance um, and, and sort of the conduct of public life, but often had very little to say about private life and individual life. Um, which is one of the reasons that we have all sorts of problems when, um, when seemingly um, upstanding public figures turn out to have um, skeletons in their closets. Um, on the other hand, perhaps because of its foundation in a notion of sort of nurturance um, uh, uh, and, and sort of development and, uh, and care within, um, first within the family, first within the household and then outwards. Um, feminist ethics of care, think about the public and the private together, think about them conjoined, think about them coextensively. Um, so that um, in many ways, we look towards private life as a foundation for understanding what care might be, what um, caring action might be and so forth. A related element is the idea that the ethics of care is an ethics of the whole self. So again, if we were thinking about um, other forms of ethical reasoning as arising, especially in the, in the, in the context of the Western Enlightenment, um, it's also associated with that other principal figure of the Western Enlightenment, which is the rational actor. The sort of disembodied, um, um, disembodied forms of rationality, a dispassionate evaluation of of options and so forth that um, is that separates rationality from from other elements of experience, from affect and emotionality, and um, and and you know other forms of being, from physicality and so forth. Feminist ethics of care, on the other hand, wants to think wants to place the whole self into the frame for thinking about what ethics um, is and should be. And then finally, um, relationality is at the center of this. That is what we owe to each other, how we engage with each other, what um, um, and, and what, what we get back from each other. And so the fundamental question is not about the self, is not about the individual, is not about the lone disembodied actor, but rather is about how it is that we can collectively form new ways of being, we can collectively produce desirable forms of life, we can collectively um, engage in particular ways of ways of being and acting with each other. And so I think you can see perhaps why, uh, why I feel that there's some really valuable things in here when we think about uh, data and digitality, because it also encourages us to think relationally about data, that data is something that doesn't just happen in the world, that data is something that happens in between people. Some data is something, a way of describing particular kinds of engagements, particular kinds of interactions. And so data is itself a sort of collective thing, it's even in that, even in the word, there's various problems with the words data, which sort of suggests given, right? That's, that's it's, it's, um, its original its original root, whereas data is often taken rather than given. But either whether we think about data or capta as some, some, sometimes argued in terms of taken, a, a sort of taken rather than given kind of notion, it's always in the giving and in the taking that is in the sort of mutual engagement. So there's some value here in thinking about in thinking about um, the in taking relationality as a central component of what an ethics of technology and AI might be. And similarly, you might we might similarly um, in incorporate um, um, the, the whole self and the human as well as the, the sort of the, the disembodied and the rational as the basis of, as the basis of um, care for AI and data and so forth. So, so I've been turning towards this um, care ethics in order to try to sort of understand an alternative account of what an ethics may be that, um, that speaks to questions of, questions of data and AI um, in contrast to the sort of like otherwise dominant accounts. But that's sort of one of two theories that I've been trying to um, trying to use in order to try to unpack and open up the uh, unpack the issues of, of of ethics for for data and AI, but also to open up new kinds of questions that are being uh, that, that I think are otherwise sort of neglected. And so the second one is what I'm labeling here as sort of like decolonial thinking. So let me just sort of explain a little bit about what it is I mean by that and why it has a particular kind of 
um, relevance. So I'll place it sort of historically within the, the lens of the, the post-colonial. Post so, so post-colonial studies, and I've sort of written in the past about, about the relevance of post-colonial studies for HCI. Post-colonial studies, it has to be emphasized first, is not fundamentally about the fact that colonialism is over. In fact, if anything, it is quite the opposite. It is, it is the fact that um, colonial um, attitudes and colonial frameworks pervade everyday life, but in new ways. Um, colonialism operates in a different kind of mode in contemporary life. And what's more, much of contemporary life is influenced by and shaped by the, a, a sort of history of colonialism. So post-colonial studies is largely a sort of analytic practice that tries to open up that kind of historicizing uh, view onto the operation of contemporary institutions, um, um, economic relations, uh, geopolitics, and so forth. Decolonial thinking, on the other hand, wants to try to take that one step further. Decolonial thinking is, is generally uh, dissatisfied with the sort of analytic perspective of the post-colonial and wants to know, uh, wants to argue for ways in which aspects of colonial history can be undone. Now, one might think about the decolonial then in terms of uh, um, indigenous struggles for, um, for land rights or for uh, mineral rights or a reconfiguration of the of sort of like international relations um, around sort of decolo around colonial histories and so forth. But um, decolonial thinkers have taken this much further um, and uh, spoken especially relevantly for us about the ways in which, um, many kinds of uh, um, scientific methodologies embody themselves colonial kinds of ideas, ideas about the independence of um, of rationality and human being, um, or the power um, to be afforded to be afforded to certain kinds of individuals. I actually had a paper in Kai this year using some of these ideas to talk about um, the notion of iterative design and what it is that iteration demands of people, that iteration demands hopefulness, iteration demands um, or requires um, uh, forbearance on the part of those who are using, you know, half-baked, half-developed technologies and so forth, that these, and these may not be rad reasonable um, requests to make of people who live in, in poverty or are um, marginalized by, by the, um, um, by the larger socioeconomic regimes. And so people like uh, Linda Dwight Smith um, and others have explored the ways in which scientific methodologies themselves, the question of how it is we think that people can talk and act, um, or even the as ascriptions we make to individuals as researchers rather than to communities, um, um, reflect colonial, colonial attitudes that need to be sort of undone or um, remade in, uh, in a decolonial context. Um, and so the, the, the relevance of, um, of decolonial thinking is often to the methods by which we undertake research. But I'm going to argue that there's actually some very particular ones that apply um, within, within the history of AI. So if I want to argue that decolonial thinking is particularly useful for data and AI, then I might have to sort of speak to the, the, the presence of the colonial within, um, within uh, um, AI and computer science more broadly. Um, and so one simple uh, uh, you know, thing we can point to historically is the link between AI and the military, um, the AI and, uh, and military thinking and military systems in general. Um, it was the military largely in the person of DARPA and ARPA who um, sponsored much of um, AI research in the first instance um, back in the 1950s and 1960s. It was the um, DARPA's program of centers of excellence that established um, places like the Stanford AI Lab, the MIT AI Lab, AI Lab and CMU as the primary centers of AI thinking and AI development um, and which sort of like marshaled particular kinds of resources in order to produce 
uh, AI as a tech as a technology, and the military has continued to be deeply enrolled in the AI enterprise um, through things like um, image processing for um, for satellite imagery, um, the kinds of sort of autonomous control systems that we associate with uh, with. Um, with drones, for example, and of course, it was the military that sponsored the um, the uh, the initial um, autonomous driving projects that are you know now um, allegedly on the cusp of um, uh, sh reshaping all of our lives. So there is a sort of a deeply colonial practice that's actually at the heart of historically of AI. Now you might argue that this is simply um, happenstance that it could easily have been sponsored by but sponsored by others but I don't actually know I'm, I don't actually buy that at all because of the ways in which um, um, the, the funding cycles operate and just the kinds of largesse that, um, that, that that military funding provides right so you could suggest that actually it could be nobody other than the military who could have produced AI in the mode in the modes in which we are we have become familiar with it. If so many of contemporary AI applications are um, themselves sort of focused on the on the on classification um, and and identi you know identifying um, um, objects according to their properties and that very idea of um, classification and the categorization of especially of peoples through um, you know facial features and other kinds of things um, is actually one that's deeply bound up with um, colonial experience and racial experience real you know? um, um, the history of fingerprinting for instance is a history History of um, of identifying uh, um, native workers in, um, in in the British Raj, um, and so so the, the very idea, in fact, of the kinds of record keeping that we um, so frequently associate with um, large scale data processing, and especially the sort of the issues of properties and classification, are themselves deeply bound up with colonial histories because these are exactly where they have their points of point, points of origin. Um, similarly, the ideas of sort of the, the particular kinds of sites of power, the particular kinds of sites of, um, of sort of concentrations of activity um, reproduce in AI and in high tech in general, a sort of notion of colonies and metropoles that um, is, a, you know, is a familiar notion to anybody who's studied the history of, for instance, the British Empire and so forth. So, so there's, I think, all sorts of different kinds of ways in which we can see AI as a merging out of um, a, a, a sort of first a sort of practical history of colonial occupation, but also and even more importantly, an intellectual history. That is that the very kinds of notions we have about what um, intelligence might be, the very notions that we might have about what makes something intelligent and something else not, um, what makes something uh, um, a sort of like an aspirational image and what makes something else not about how it is that uh, that the notions of the self are being incorporated into the the idea of the production of intelligent agents. Um, these are themselves sort of the intellectual histories and the intellectual legacies of colonialism and the sort of way that decolonial practice might want to um, might want to unpack. So the one of the things that I think is really sort of valuable in this work um, and one of the places where there's a really useful nexus is um, the kinds of things that, for instance, um, Arturo Escobar writes about in, in his book Designs for the Pluriverse, because what he's arguing for there is a notion of design and development that doesn't seek singular outcomes, that doesn't seek large, you know, collective practices that are to be the same for all of us. He draws inspiration from the Zapatista slogan, a world where many worlds fit. That is, he's asking the question, how is it that we can understand, how we can harness design practice in order to produce outcomes that respect diversity and difference, um, uh, the independence of different kinds of, of different kinds of groups. Um, now, in fact, if you read Designs for the Pluriverse from the perspective of, say, um, uh, you know, the kind of critical design that's familiar from, from critical HCI, you might be surprised at the positivity that Escobar 
um, um, expresses about how it is that design can save us and design can save indigenous communities in um, in, in uh, Brazil and so forth. Um, whereas I think actually for many of us who are operating in technology, we're often actually much more cautious um, and concerned about the idea of the rush to design and so forth. I kind of think it comes from the fact that Escobar is otherwise a developmental anthropologist. And so if you've been working in, in, in development for the last like 30 years, then every, every everything that's an alternative development seems like a positive development and so a positive change. And so he's much more positive about design than I, than, than I would expect. But the point I think I want to sort of point to here is, is well, two for, two, twofold. Um, um, one is that um, he wants to try to capture a picture of design that um, that speaks to different kinds of relations and different kinds of collectives. So here we have an overlap, I think, with, uh, with feminist care ethics and one that brings it into conversation with notions of design. And the other thing that's actually really nice in this work is uh, a different way in which we might kind of want to think about autonomy. Um, so if you notice, let's, well, let's go backwards, um, um, the subtitle of Escobar's book here is um, Radical Interdependence, Autonomy and the Making of Worlds. And he wants to think about autonomy in a way that autonomy is clearly a, a, a very common word in, in AI, but he wants to think about it differently than I think we might do otherwise. He wants to think about autonomy in a sort of collective sense. So we talk about sort of automated decision making in terms of sort of the auto an autonomous vehicles that are somehow independent of us. But there's a variety of other kinds of ways in which we can think about autonomy. Um, you know, freedom from, from manipulation is the term that Susser et al. use um, in, in their paper on, on misinformation um, and digital decision making. But for um, Escobar, he wants to sort of think about what he calls radical interdependence. So collective self-determination is the foundation of autonomy. That is the autonomy of different kinds of communities and different kinds of groups to plot their own futures. Um, and so I think this work really usefully causes us to ask some questions about who gets to be autonomous, what gets to be autonomous, and autonomous from what or from whom, and why, with what sorts of um, um, goals in mind. Uh, what, are the, what are the values um, of, of autonomy here, and to whom do they, uh, do they, do they apply? So if we want to sort of come back Sorry, that's a rather abrupt shift, but it's like these are the kinds of um, things that I'm looking at in order to try to gain a different perspective on, on the question of ethics. Because the problem with the question of ethics is that it's not actually clear what the question is. When we ask about ethics in AI, we typically ask questions like, how do we build ethics into um, artificially intelligent systems? How do we build ethics into large systems that are based on large scale data processing? And how do we ensure that AI both now and in the future reflects our ethical norms? And these are sort of the standard questions that, um, that, that sort of shape the conversation about AI and ethics. But I think they're the wrong questions. I'd rather ask, what ethics are already built into AI? That is, how is it that AI is already built upon an ethical framework? And what kinds of ethical framework do we think? Uh, what, what do we think about that framework? So how is it that AI is already conditioned on the notion, for instance, that a piece of data in one place is the same as a piece of data in another? Or when I take this data from one place and move it to another, that's, um, that's, a, that's a reasonable move. Or, or indeed, that data might be collective. Um, that data speaks for itself. These are the sort of questions that are foundational to AI. And I think they're actually not just technical questions, but they're ethical questions, they're moral questions. Um, and these are the questions I would rather be asking. How is it that these things are already there? What ethics are already present as the foundation of AI and data analytics? And more broadly then, um, not just how do we uh, um, ensure uh, that our ethical values are respected by future of AI systems, but how is it that AI systems intervene more broadly into social moral relations, into how it is that we all relate to each other um, as members of society, as members of communities, as um, you know, and around our sort of mutual recognition of particular forms of um, of moral reasoning and so forth. So 
I'm going to leave it there. These are this has been very open. It's not I'm not offering any kind of answers uh, in this particular in this presentation. What I'm doing instead is trying to sort of take you through the the foundations of an alternative way of thinking about moral reasoning um, and open up some opportunities for a different kind of dialogue between um, ethics and moral philosophy and and artificial intelligence um, and. Um, and so I'm going to stop there um, and hopefully my internet connection is good enough for me to be able to take some questions. Oh, that was great. Uh, do we have questions on the side? Are you going to send the record to the link later? Um, All right, so um, that was that was super great. That was super interesting. I feel like, um, uh, yeah, you, w whenever I listen to you talk, Paul, it always feels like I'm I'm listening to uh, you're doing the the hard work for me. So, you know, <laughs> I think I, I think that talk also leaves plenty of it um, on the floor or on the table still to be done. But sure. uh, but, but yeah. thank you. It's an invitation. For, <laughs> for sure. There you go. There you go. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, so I just want to let everyone know that this is, you know, invite them to ask questions at this point. So we're going to have sort of a general sort of Q&A. Um, uh, so uh, the, if you if you don't want to speak, you can also type your questions in, but please. Oh, Gabe, welcome back. Hi, Dustin. Um, hi, Professor Durst. I uh, really enjoyed your talk um, and the final provocation that you had around asking what ethics currently exist in AI. Um, I'm curious from, from a kind of a practical standpoint um, with so much of uh, the AI that defines our everyday existence being kind of held behind the doors mm -hmm. of, of private industry. Um, are there practices of, of reverse engineering or accountability or um, or just anything of being able to unpack this question of ethics um, mm -hmm. in the private sector that you see working, or do you have thoughts on what that might look like? Uh, that's a that's that's a really great great question. Um, and I don't know if you've seen it, but Jenna Burrell at Berkeley has this really fabulous paper on what she calls algorithmic opacity. So she was writing slightly before the current AI moment, but just sort of thinking about what are the ways in which AI's practices are sort of like hidden from us? So, so trade secrecy is clearly one. Um, technical expertise and the fact that, that the operation of these systems is open to scrutiny only to adequately qualified individuals is another. Um, but of course, in the in sort of like contemporary data-driven AI, which is so based in statistical model generation and classification, um, we don't, even the technical experts don't know what it is that the AI is doing, right? You know, that is, we've identified a series of patterns in data, but what those patterns actually are, what they mean um, is, um, is largely uh, unavailable to us because it's the thing that can only come out of this sort of massification of data. So there are many sources of that sort of opacity um, that, that create challenges here. Um, one thing that has been moderate or reasonably successful, sorry, I don't want to, don't want to sort of seem to denigrate it, is one, one useful approach that um, a number of people I identified is sort of procedure of automated algorithmic auditing, um, whereby you can um, actually essentially subject AI systems to an evaluative process by throwing lots of examples at them and seeing whether there are patterns of bias and so forth and what comes back. Um, Christian Sandvig at, uh, at Michigan has sort of like led the charge not only on the idea of doing this, um, but in fact, to do that was actually often um, often involved breaking the terms of service agreements of particular corporations, which was held to be in a, um, 
a, a crime according to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And so Christian and Kerry Carajalio said UIUC and others along with the ACLU actually sued the Justice Department to, um, to open up the space for, for scientific inquiry into the operation of algorithmic systems of this sort so that you could try to sort of unpack um, uh, that stuff and get beyond the, the the walled gardens and the doors of the, of, the, of those large corporations and so that's had some that's had some benefit um I mean you started your question by by asking about sort of like you know asking about this pragmatically or as a practical matter which is a sensible thing to do and something that I'm really generally terribly bad at answering because somehow somehow my stuff isn't is never terribly terribly practical but I do think that trying to sort of unpack some of the what I was sort of calling in the talk, the, the intellectual history of AI um, uh, is asking a set of questions about how our AI systems come to be. And I think even just sort of exposing um, some of the, the implicit assumptions um, in, in how AI proceeds and how data, data analytics proceeds and what we think that data is and who gets to own it and where it should be and all those kinds of things um, um, enables us to ask some more pointed questions of the corporate entities, even when we're not necessarily in a position to directly examine what it is that their systems are, systems are doing. So I think it's an ongoing challenge. And I think it's the sort of thing that there are, there will have to be many different points of entry into. Uh, we have a comment on the side here about neurodiversity, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, um, so this is, that's not an area of my expertise, but is, um, but is, it, 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 I think, very relevant, and it's something that a number of my, my colleagues are working on. We've just at Irvine had um, established this new center that I'm going to be running, which is the, the Center for Responsible, Ethical, and Accessible Technologies. And by accessible there, we're including um, the, 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 um, the, the experience of disability communities, including sort of questions of neurodiversity, as well as questions about um, workplace, work force diversity and participation from different kinds of marginalized communities within the process of doing design and development. Um, and those questions of, of, of diversity, given that they're, again, not so much my expertise or ones where I'm really relying on, on some of my colleagues, uh, Stacey Branham, um, Anne-Marie Piper, have been doing sort of really great work in here. But yeah, I think, I mean, one particular thing about neurodiversity within the context of the, the, the AI conversation rather than a broader tech conversation is how people think that brains work and how people think that people work because there is an enormous amount of folk theorizing going on from a sort of privileged and fairly, uh, um, a fairly uniform and a homogeneous group of people um, who are continually banding around these ideas about how that is that they think that people work. I was just um, I need to be careful what I say since I can see the little thing flashing saying it's recording. Um, you know, I was just involved in a grant writing exercise along with a number of, um, of, of colleagues around questions of AI and communication and, and was continually running into um, folk theories that computer scientists have about how communication works, which communication scholars and philosophers of language have been sort of debunking for decades. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm not quite sure about this. And so I think that question, I mean, certainly within the, the context of AI, you are seeing um, a further uh, uh, privileging of particular kinds of accounts of, uh, of neuronormativity um, that is that is that is very worrying for sure, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to make um, an aspect of the program of this center that we're setting up. Yes, neurotypical. Thank you for reminding me of that of, of that that term. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, the the two questions that you you end with um, sort of it seems like they're the the first one you know what ethics are already built into ai seems like a sort of the the beginning of a, a more critical sort of uh study of the history maybe trying to understand you know the, this kind of 
tying into the sort of decolonial, post-colonial mm -hmm. sort of ideas mm -hmm. that you were talking about. And then the, um, the second question, how do AI systems intervene into social moral relations? Oh, speaking of moral social relations, my daughter just walked out. Um, Give me something to do that's interesting and I want to do it. Why do you have a background that looks like a bunch of trash? Um, it's very insulting. Okay. Um, well, my we're. My bedroom. My bedroom is not a bucket of trash. This is the, uh, the reality of my situation right now. Anyways. Um, Bye. So, so, so anyways, the, uh, um, uh, I, I guess that, 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 that sort of idea makes me think about like the future of these technologies and how they're applied, you know, what they're applied to, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, trying to, you know, what kinds of problems do we try to solve? Right, right. I mean, I think, let's see, there's a couple of things. If you had... If we had done this yesterday, I would have answered this question differently. Um, um, but I just, like a couple of hours before getting onto this call, um, finished reading the galleys of uh, Kate Crawford's new book, Atlas of AI, which is utterly fabulous. Um, and, and really sort of is laying a lot of the groundwork for exactly that sort of intellectual history of of, and it's not just AI, actually, I think it's computer science in general, but um, that I think is really important, which is unpacking where these ideas come from, understanding the institutional and historical context in which they develop, and understanding what their limits are, and how those limits are now carrying forward to the situations that we are building and the technologies that we are building. So um, Kate's book is not out until um, some point in early or mid April, but I recommend it all to you. It's going to be it's going to be great. And so I'm hoping or I'm very glad actually to see that um, people like Kate have already been thinking about these things and some of that work is already is, is already coming up. Um, I think one of the reasons that I'm interested in those questions is um, not to be destructive, not to sort of like dismantle um, the notion of AI, but rather to sort of capture what it can be and capture what it can do. So for example, um, within the, the, the sort of the, all the questions that have arisen over the last couple of years about fairness and bias in large scale data automated decision making that often come from the kinds of data sets on which AI systems have been trained and, and those when those embodied um, um, racial biases, then the decision-making processes often embodied racial biases too. Um, those things have led to a lot of interest in de-biasing systems and you know, eliminating, for instance, the sort of uh, the, the patterns of, of racial discrimination that might be in those systems. But I think that's a really low bar to be holding these technologies to. Um, it's not a question of how do we eliminate racism in AI, but how do you build you know, anti-racism AI, for example. And then the question becomes, do we have the intellectual foundations to do that work? That is, can you use the tools that we have spent um, you know, a couple of hundred years developing to do that work? And that's why I think we need to be able to do some of this um, archaeological exercise. Um, but it's absolutely with a view towards what can be, what we can do, what we want to do, and what we sort of want to bring into um, bring within our, within our reach and ask the question about what, if we ask what the limits of our contemporary sort of intellectual tools are, it gives us a starting point for thinking about what um, alternatives we might like in order to be able to produce worlds that we want. So, so, so what, I, what I hear you saying is the, our ability to just, um, to be, to self-reflect and be aware of these issues is one of the challenges that we're dealing with, you know, that. Uh, that's, I think that's uh, absolutely, I mean, that is, I think, I think that these uh, histories need to be, and, and assumptions need to be part of our conversation, right? So again, if our assumptions about ethics are that ethical reasoning is the sort of thing that, you know, that, that, uh, that, that is the domain of a particular set of people, right? Again, if we, if we want to sort of place, for instance, an ethics of justice 
uh, um, at the at the pinnacle of our understanding of what ethical reasoning is, and similarly then sort of like you know dismiss or denigrate other forms, um, then that comes with consequences, and we need to make that visible so that we can be having a conversation about what um, what we believe those norms should be and can be. Uh, we have a question on the side here from Nathan about. Uh recommendations for books for um for beginners from a beginner um, yeah um again i'm watching this little red light flashing at me telling me things are being recorded so i have to be careful because there are any number there's a lot of stuff out there and lots of it isn't really terribly good um i will give a shout out once more to um to to kate crawford's upcoming book it's not available just yet but it will be it will be soon um, which deals explicitly with some of these with some of these questions through the lens of the lenses of like energy and extractive industries and state interventions and some of and issues of sort of classification and categorization um, and so forth. I think you can look back. There's things that are not necessarily primarily about AI, but have a lot to tell us um, more broadly in the sort of area of science and technology studies. One book that I frequently recommend is um, Susan Lee Starr and Jeff, Jeff Bowker's book, uh, Sorting Things Out on Classification and Its Consequences, which is um, broader than about AI and technology, but so deeply relevant to almost everything that, 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 that's going on in there. Um, many of you will probably already know about things like um, Ruha Benjamin's book, um, Race After Technology, which again is focused on a particular set of questions, but that exemplifies in um, uh, exemplifies the, the significance of these kinds of these kinds of um, technologies. So there are a lot of different kind of things out there. As I say, I'm I'm somewhat skeptical about about many of them, um, but those are those are some good things to look at. Yeah, sorting things out. Uh, some of my students were just reading that um, this week. It's, it's the classic. Um, Gabe, you have a, another question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Paul, you have to forgive me as a, as a, a former academic who's now in, in industry. I, I am always kind of oriented towards like uh, the kind of practical implications, and while I, I certainly you know respect the kind of point of of where you are in the kind of intellectual journey of defining some of these big questions and the larger frameworks. Um, I do wonder like in order to help or not, I don't know help is probably not the right way of putting this, but in order to, to support industry in reflecting on different frameworks to uh, potentially adopt and, and, and think through, I wonder, is it the, the role of, of academia at this point to really dive into a lot of kind of, uh, you know, speculative design work, um, uh, design fiction, exploring, you know, what these say like an AI system based off of a, of a model of care ethics might look like and, and what the implications might be there. Because in so many conversations with industry, it's like, there, you know, if you take any kind of social media platform, right? Like all decisions ladder up to attention, right? Like all decisions around the development of AI ladder up to keeping people on a site. And so um, how do we right. how do we model these alternatives for them so that they seem appealing? Um, I guess is my yeah. Point. Yeah, no, no, look, it's a great question. Again, I will, I will, I will preface my response by saying I'm moving in the op or have moved in the opposite direction from you, having been in industry for ten years, and it's like and then then coming back to academia, so allowing myself the um to 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 do some different kinds of things about this stuff. Um, yeah, look, I think that by and large the way that academia has framed the um the intervention has been in terms of guidelines and you know, you know, ethical roadmaps and 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 things of that sort um, you know and which it should be said is often what people both in industry and more broadly even in sort of like tech education have asked for I've frequently been in places where people just say well you know I'm a 
programmer, I'm a software developer, I'm not trained in this stuff, I really just need somebody to give me some rules to, to, to follow. What are those What are those rules going to be? And by and large, I think what academia has delivered has been a series of guidelines. Um, and if you look at, there's a lot of great analyses of these. There's one done by Anna Jobim and, and, and others that's, that's really um, useful. It's like they collected together, you know, some 90 or so different kind of sets of codes of practice, um, and and procedural guidelines for for people working in these spaces and and the, they, they all use the same words and they don't tend to mean anything right because nobody quite knows how to how these become operationalizable and so I think you may be right that that um that uh, a more sort of like speculative design mode in which we can tell different kinds of stories and have people uh, you know engage people's sort of design skills in a different way um, is a more useful <clears throat> way into this. I worry, on the other hand, um, that the um, that the, those those tend very quickly to fall into a fairly hackneyed set of dystopian. Uh, you know, it becomes black mirror very fast, right? And 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 while those are useful things for us. Um, I, I wonder if they don't sort of end up painting a picture that's far too far too black and white. Um, and it does concern me that the dystopian lies not far below the surface, even of, um, of well-intentioned industry practitioners. That is, there's, the, the downside is always sort of um, um, a focus of, of, of humor. It's a focus of conversation. It's known to be there. Um, uh, um, Gina Neff and uh, and a number of colleagues whose names suddenly suddenly um, um, escape me, I'm afraid, uh, um, at the University of Washington had a really nice paper about the problems that arise when a bunch of social scientists come along and try to identify problems for technologists, of which those technologists, being smart people, are entirely aware already. Um, so we do need some different ways to formulate that conversation. Um, I, 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 I do look with some hope towards um, this sort of speculative design movement, but I worry that things become a little too um, parodied, a little too fast, and we need some more sophisticated um, um, thinking. And that's why I sort of, you know, I work ethnographically, so I'm by and large looking for, uh, for empirical accounts and I'm looking especially at the moment for empirical accounts of the forms of ethical reasoning in which people are engaged in how it is they formulate the costs and benefits and make decisions for their own practice because it's clear that this stuff is just happening in industry because these are practical problems that practical people need to be able to resolve. Um, and, and understanding what the resources are upon which they can draw in order to make those decisions seems to me like the first step in, um, in moving towards better decision making. So I think that's still, that's still perhaps um, not moving as fast as you might like me to with a pragmatic bent and that seems perfectly fair. Um, but that's sort of where, at least in my work, that's where I am just now. Any other questions before we, we wrap things up? Well, thank you, Paul. This was really great. Um, thanks for the invitation. I was very glad to be able to do it. Thank you for, for bearing with me with respect to just uh, the, the, the recorded video. It may not have been so noticeable to you. It's excruciating for me to have to sit through 41 minutes of listening to myself gabble on about this stuff. So, so, so I hope you, none of you ever actually have to do that again. But, um, but yeah, it was, I'm, I'm really glad to be here and be part of the conversation. Yeah, well, thanks for joining us. All right, well, uh, have a great day. Just talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.